We're getting ready to take a test this morning. How many love tests? How many does not like tests? But we're getting ready to take one. Yeah. Joy, turn me up just a hair, please, ma'am. If I get too loud, then you can just back off this. I'm going to leave that up to you. Turn in your, in your Bibles to St. Matthew chapter 22. And I'll probably will wind up getting a little bit loud so you can adjust me. 36, 37, and 38. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The name of the message this morning is this. The first and great commandment. Love God. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, it's in verse 26. We read these words. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. Now if man was created in the image and after the likeness of God, then man should have some similarities, some attributes, some characteristics that the Godhead possesses. First of all, when it comes to God, God is a trinity. God is made up of God the Father, of God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The similarity with that of man is the fact that man also is a trinity. Man is made up of spirit, man is made up of soul, and man is made up of body. The spirit is that part of man which knows and which aligns himself to the spiritual creation and gives him a God consciousness. The soul itself implies self-conscious life as distinguished from that of plants which have no consciousness of that of life. Then there's the body. And the body houses both the spirit and that of the soul. Yet God is infinite. He is unlimited. But then man is limited. But yet man is personal, and he's rational, and he's moral. He's a moral being. He can distinguish between that of right and that of wrong, like God. But all of God's attributes of his omniscience, omniscient being that God knows all, his omnipotence, God has all power, and his omnipresence, God is everywhere. Of course, man is not these three things. But he is known for his great love more than anything else. 
And reason being is because that is what God is. I want you to listen to a few words from the Apostle John in 1 John 4 and 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. Verse 8. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. Look at these words. For God is love. I just have got to believe that if God is love, and he is, when man was made, created, in his image and likeness, the creator had to put that attribute, that characteristic, in that of his creation and that of man. The problem is that man misplaces the love that God has instilled in him. Can I get an amen on that? Question. Who really has first place in your heart? Or what do you love most of all? If men answer this question truthfully, what would they really say? One would say, I love money, and I'm doing all that I can to get more of it. And I want to be rich. While the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6 and 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which some have coveted after. They have erred from the faith, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Another would say, I love good health. Don't get me wrong. Our bodies is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And we need to take care of our body. But they say, I'm going to do everything I can to build up a strong body. But yet Genesis 3 and 19 says this, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. For thus thou art, and to dust, he says, shalt thou return. Another would say, I love food. Have you ever heard this before? Call me. You can call me anything you want to. Just call me three times a day. By the way, some of you is probably not going to like this. But a lot of us are digging our graves with our teeth. I look forward to going to the table three times each day. Matter of fact, I like a few snacks in between. But the Bible says in John 16, 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life. How about this? We may have a few of those in here. Another would say, I love myself. But the Bible says in Romans 14 and 7, None of us liveth to himself, no man die to himself. God has not given us the attribute, He has not given us the characteristic of that of love for us to sit back and for us to love money. He has not instilled into us the attribute or the character as far as that of health, as far as food. But God has given us love that we're to love our enemies. And to love the brethren. And to love our neighbors. But most of all, God has given us the attribute and the characteristic of that of love. That most of all, that we can love God. I told you you may have to wind up turning me down. But hold on just for a minute. What is the first and great commandment? Matthew 22 and 37. 
Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And then Mark, in his gospel, he adds to this commandment just a little bit in Mark 12 and 30 and says, With all thy strength. When it comes to loving God, we need to love him and be sincere. We need to love God with all of our heart. It must be with intelligence. He says, with all thy mind. God does not want fanatical devotion from us. It must be emotional with all of our soul. Full of warmth and feeling. It must be energetic, and here's one of Deborah's famous words intense. Of course, she don't use that word towards me. She may be looking in the movie and say that was very intense. But with all thy strength. Love to God must be supreme. We must love Him more than sin, more than honor, more than riches, more than pleasure, more than creatures, more than life itself. And the acid test of genuine discipleship is love. And here is where the test comes in. Let's put ourselves to the test and let's see how much we really love God. Here's the first point. Get your bulletin. Write this down. What is the trend of your thoughts? In other words, what do you think about the most? Not the thoughts that are created by circumstances, but on the average, what do you have your mind on? Put a star by what I'm about to say. Most of the time, we think about who or what we love. Thank you, ma'am. Can I repeat that? Most of the time, we think about who or what we love. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. In other words, your mind is your thoughts. do you think about the most? The odds are what you think about the most is what you really love the most. Abraham, Genesis 18 and 1. The Lord appears to Abraham in the plains of Mamre. He sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. What do you reckon Abraham was thinking about? Where was his thoughts? What was he loving? It had to be God. Because if you read a little bit further in Genesis 18 and 2 and on down, you will read where he's been visited by God that he sees three angels and the angel of the Lord It's common to pay him a visit. I want to believe that Abraham's mind and his thoughts are on God. And God is paying him a visit. 
I like the latter part of that verse 1 of chapter 18 when it says that he's in his tent's door in the heat of the day. Has anybody felt the heat this week? Has the heat been on any of you this week? Kind of has me. I think I got aggravated this week, which is very rare. But people will really provoke you. Can I get a witness on that? But when the heat is on, God will come your way. And God will pay you a visit. And then there was Isaac. She can pull that up too, she don't mind. Isaac is going out to meditate in the field at evening tide. And he lifts up his eyes and he saw and behold the camels were coming and she's going to light lid upon a camel. That's a joke between me and somebody. I know she's got her, he's got her mind on her, on Eliezer bringing his bride, but I also got to believe that Isaac is thinking about God. About God and his bride. Because that is what he is going to love. A psalm of David, Psalms 104 and 33. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Verse 34. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Does that tell you where David's mind is and what David really loves? I'm going to sing to God. I'm going to sing to God with all my being. I'm going to meditate upon him. I'm going to think upon him. And my meditation is going to be sweet. Does any of you sometimes have trouble with your mind? Do you ever feel like sometimes you're losing your mind? Can I get a witness? You go in room sometimes to get something and you forgot what you went in there for? The young people ain't supposed to be having that problem. Joy, pull up Isaiah. See what Isaiah had to say. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. In Philippians, the Apostle Paul writes concerning our thoughts, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are, are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any praise, if there be any, uh, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. There are six things that you can underline that the Apostle Paul said that you know what, we need to think on these things, and every one of these six things could apply to Jesus Christ. See, so what are you thinking about this morning? What did you what do you spend your time in your mind? My question is, is it on God? Is it on Him? Let's go a little bit further. We shouldn't just think about God at Christmas. We shouldn't just think about God at Easter. We shouldn't just think about God at come funeral time. We shouldn't just think about God when, when things are tough. But God, God should be habitual, train of thought, 
for every day because we love him. Is, it, is this not true? So the, the test right now is this, for you to answer for yourself. What is it that you really, really keep your mind on? Here's the second thing. What is your attitude towards God's Word? Is it God's Word to you? Is it the only safe God? Is it the revealer of that of your defects? Is it food for your soul? Is it a lamp to your feet? Put a star by what I'm getting ready to say. All who love him are going to love his word. And all that love his word, they love him. There are seven different images that the Word of God, that the Bible gives us about the Word. Anybody like to hear what they are? The Word of God is a seed. 1 Peter 1 and 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruption by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It is a food, Matthew 4 and 4, but he, he being Jesus, answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It is a lamp, it's a light, Psalms 119 and 105. The Word is a lamp unto my feet, and it's a light unto my path. It is a fire, Jeremiah 23 and 9. It's not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Matter of fact, let's go back to that verse again. It is a hammer, Jeremiah 23 and 29. It's not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. It is a double-edged sword, Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And then there's James, and it's in chapter 1 that James basically tells us that the word of God is a mirror. Amen. Um, there are people that have their opinions about you. And some of their opinions differ about you. And it's important of what people think about us to a certain degree. But what's more important above that is not altogether what people think about us, but what God thinks about us. Back in the Old Testament, anybody heard of the tabernacle, the congregation? Anybody ever heard of the, about the ark? We're not talking about Hollywood, Raiders of the Lost Ark, but this was part of the furnishing. You remember that the, the tabernacle of the congregation contained an outer court. It contained a fence all the way around, and then it had a, such a wide eastern gate. And you remember the priests would go through the gate, and the people would go through the gate, and they would offer their sacrifices. But did you know that the furnishings of the tabernacle of the congregation was put up in the shape of a cross? Within the middle of that was the ark where the mercy seat was, where God's presence was. You know, on the outside of the court, there was, a, there was an altar there that they offered up their sacrifices. And the priests, you know, they handled the animals, and they handled the ashes. And, you know, they had to go into, there was a holy place, and there was a holy of holies. But there was a holy place that was about 15 by 30, and there was a, the holy of holies was 15 by 15 and they were to they were they would handle the animals and then they were getting ready to go into the the holy place but before they went into a holy place there's something called a laver and the laver was made of the uh, of the women's looking glasses their mirrors how many remember the compacts you know you go to the hospital today you need, you need a mirror you can't find too many women that have a compact no more matter of fact you may find a few men that no mind. let's go on them but it was made of brass, of the women's looking glass over here, and it was full of water. 
But Jonathan, here's what they did. The thing about it was they would offer up the sacrifices and handle the animals and handle the ashes. But before they went into the holy place, they looked over into the laver. And it was not the same thing as a laboratory. But they looked in and they saw their dirtiness and their uncleanness and the way they were. And they would dip out water and they would wash themselves. And when they got good and clean, they would go in and they would wait upon God. And my point is, y'all, that last thing about God's Word, it is a seed, it is a food, it is a lamp and a light, it is a fire. It's a hammer. And Billy, this is what I'm doing. I'm keeping right on preaching. I'm keeping right on preaching. I'm keeping right on preaching. It's like a hammer. You keep right on. But eventually it's going to break the rock to pieces. It is a double-edged sword. But the Word of God, basically, is for you to look in and see yourself and see how God sees you. It don't make no difference what that one says or that one says. It's what God says to you in His Word. I thought I thought it didn't cost you anything extra. But what is your attitude towards God's word? If you love God, you love his word. And if you love his word, you love God. And that brings us to another question that we're going to have to answer. What is your attitude towards God's house? Is it the Father's house? Do you love its sacred ordinances? Do you love just taking communion, knowing that the wine represents the blood of Christ and the bread, his body? The sacredness of that. Do you love water, baptism? I've seen somebody that something has taken place on the inside. And they want to let the world know and they get baptized. And Sister Frances Bats was the first one that got baptized in this church. How do you feel about that? I feel good about that. I mean, a place of prayer. A place of praise. A place of worship. A place of testimony of, of what great things that God has done. Too many churches across America is nothing but a social event, a country club, a place where businessmen can get up some business from their congregation. This is the house of dead of God. I look forward to coming to church and being in the presence of what God, I know God is, that where two or three are gathered together in his name. Been getting hit by the world and the devil all during the week, but it's good to come and to be with God's people. What do you feel about God's house? In a hurry to get here, in a hurry to leave. How many still loves me? How many still loves me? If I miss church, I feel like I hadn't been a, a service. I feel like I ain't been there in a month. And if Annie hadn't probably pushed Preston, he probably wouldn't have got his third. I don't know about that. It's third year. Jesus is in the synagogue at, at Nazareth. Jesus visits Nazareth twice at the beginning of his public ministry. Luke 4 and 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And his custom was... He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Did you know that God's son had a custom and his custom was on the Sabbath day, if you wanted to find Jesus, go to the synagogue. 
After that at Pentecost, Peter and John at the temple in Acts 3 and 1. Now Peter and John went up together and to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the night hour. But they go, Hebrews 10 and 25, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a man of some is, but exhort one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. And here's what David found in the security in Psalm 23 and 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What is your attitude towards God's word and his house? It tells you how much you love God. You don't believe in being loud down here? I got a feeling that heaven's going to be loud. You don't believe in really singing and getting into it down here? Well, I think heaven does. So, what is the trend of your thoughts? What is your attitude towards God's word? And what is your attitude towards God's house? Ooh, we got two more to go, right? And boy, this is pretty good, too. The last one's the best. We'll get that in a minute. What really is your attitude towards the world? I don't know what yours is, but I know what mine is. I'm just a pilgrim. And I'm just passing through. Do you seek its companionship? Do you seek its treasures? Do you seek its pleasures? Are you laying treasures here or are you laying treasures there? Are you looking at things that are seen or are you looking at things that are unseen? Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. In the kingdom of the law of that of riches in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6 and 19, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal, verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Can I tell you what really the way that Moses felt about the world? You know the story of Moses, right? Moses was put in the little ark, right? In the bulrushes. Because his parents saw that he was a proper child. And it happened to be, just didn't happen, but ordained by God. The king, Pharaoh's daughter, heard the baby cry. You know, we're touched by a baby's cry, right? By the way, my dad was touched a little too much because I had kidney colic when I was coming up. There was something called paragard. My family would come see my mom and dad. Here's Ronnie. Don't you want to take Ronnie? Don't you want to hold him and rock him? A lot of times I'd just be on the front porch just a swinging. 
Some of y'all don't get that. Some of y'all, some of y'all too young for that. Moses was brought up as an Egyptian. Next to that of Pharaoh. Going to all the Egyptian schools. Enjoying all the pyramids. But you know what? There was another group of people that was there besides the Egyptians. There were the Hebrews. And he knew exactly what he was. Do you know what? An acorn don't really fall far from a tree. Because he saw one of his brethren, Hebrew brethren, being abused. And you know what Moses did? He slayed him. And you know what he did? He left Egypt. Joy's going to pull up chapter 11, the heroes of faith. And here's, here's the kicker. He chose rather to suffer with the affliction of the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Some of you young people, I want to tell you this, in particular, some of us as older people have already learned the hard way. There is pleasure in sin. But I got news for you. It's only for a season. You see, the enemy of your soul paints you a pretty picture at the beginning, but does not tell you the end thereof. Alcoholism. Don't talk about daddy coming home drunk, beating up mama, spending, them alcohol, uh, spending money on alcohol to get another drink. Don't tell you about meth and everything else. Go ahead and take a smoke, go ahead and take a puff, and before the devil gets through with you, you're still and you're still from your mom and your daddy. And that dictates your life. Come on, y'all help me preach this morning. My, I, I could jump on tobacco right now too if I wanted to, right? I'm just saying, y'all, what is your attitude toward the world? Would anybody like to hear what the Apostle John's attitude was to the world? It's in 1 John. It's in chapter, chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world. We need to start right there. I thought for God to love the world. For God to love the world into the fact that he loves human beings and people that are lost. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because here's the reason. For all that is in the world is what? You'll hear me preach. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. Everything that the world basically has to offer you is not geared to your spiritual man. It is not geared to where your destination of heaven is. Everything pretty much about the world is geared to your carnality and to your flesh and to drag you down. I'm a preaching okay? Jim, I'm doing okay? Doing okay. But here is the final thing. And boy, is this the kicker. Not only what do you think about, and not only what's your attitude towards God's word, and your attitude towards God's house, and your attitude towards, God's, the, uh, uh, towards the world, but here's the fifth thing. What is your attitude towards Jesus? You see, people also had different opinions about Jesus. And a lot of these opinions were in contrast just as much as darkness is to light and light is to darkness. You see, some of the people are saying about Jesus that he is Beelzebub. That he is the prince of the devils. And that he casts out demons through the prince of dead of the devils. 
And Jesus reminds them, how in the world can Satan cast out Satan? A house divided cannot stand. They were saying he was Beelzebub. And then some were saying something else. He's a blasphemer. Because he claims to be somebody that we don't think he is. He's a deceiver. Well, my Bible tells me that he's the way, that he's the truth, and that he's the life. Some people say he's a drunkard. Some people say he's a gluttony. How can you be a gluttony when you fast for 40 days and 40 nights? Some say he's a friend of sinners. Ah. You can believe, your, you, some of you don't know this either. You can believe that on your sweet bippy. I don't know where this stuff comes from sometimes. Some say he's a friend of tax collectors. Some say he's a good man. Some say he's a prophet. Some say he's Elias. Some say he's Jeremiah. But you know what's important? You cannot necessarily control what other people think. It's not altogether of what other people think sometimes. It is what you think. Jesus is passing through the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and people were saying all things about him, and, 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 they, and they were saying, you're Jeremiah, you're Elias, you're one of the prophets, and then Jesus point blank says, but who do you say that I am? I have got the same attitude, and there she goes. I have got the same attitude that the apostle Peter has. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. I believe Jesus to be the anointed of that of God, the anointed of that of heaven. I believe he is the Messiah of that of Israel. I believe that he is the son of the living God. That's who I believe. That is my attitude. You see, there's, there's religions going around that cannot deny the fact historically of the existence of Jesus. They just deny who he is. If you believe that he's the son of God, Give the Lord a wave. Not only do I believe that he's the son of God, I believe exactly what the angel of the Lord believed on that first Christmas. Joy, if you pull it up, please, ma'am. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. which is Christ, the anointed, the Messiah, the Lord. You see, not only is he the Son of God, but he is my Savior. And that's not all. He is the only Savior that there is. Not only... Is my attitude that he's the son of God and not only is my attitude that he's my savior but he's something else I have the same attitude about Jesus 
that Job had. Joe, if you'll pull that up, please, ma'am, what Job said. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. You know what Redeemer is, Omen? It's somebody that pays a price for someone or something else. You see, I believe that he's the Son of God. I believe that he's my Savior. I believe that he's my Redeemer. I believe that I have it be redeemed with, with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb slain from the foundation of the of the world. I believe that one time I was lost and undone without God's Son. I was dead in my trespasses and in my sin. I was in darkness, but I had been pulled into his marvelous light into his presence. I have been quickened by his spirit, bless God, and have experienced a spiritual resurrection in my life. I believe that he paid the price for my salvation and has redeemed not only me, but whoever will come and trust in his name. I'm preaching, but in y'all are sure amen and Anybody else like to know what he is? I had the same attitude about Jesus that Thomas had. You remember Jesus appears to the ten at his resurrection. Thomas is not there. Remember? But later he appears to all 11. Thomas, you doubted. Take your hand, your finger, and put in the nail prints. Thrust your hand into my side. You remember what Thomas said, Joy? My Lord. Come on, y'all. He's my Lord. And he's my God. He's the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. He's, he's the Redeemer. He's my Lord, and He's my God. But something else, y'all, He is to me. I got the same attitude about this that John had. Anybody in here claim to be perfect? Would you please rise? I would like to meet who you are. I claim to be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. But you know what? I'm not perfect. I hadn't even told Deborah about me getting aggravated Friday. Had nothing to do with her. Look, can I remind you about something? The Bible says, "Be be angry and sin not." But I won't tell you what John said. Please, ma'am, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have the Advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. You know, the Olympics is going on right now. I think the Americans didn't do too good the other night in ice skating. One fell right out. Once you fall right out, you've had it. You have had it. But I'm going to tell you one thing. It's not like this person, Norman, serving God. I have fallen many times. Anybody else fell, fell with me? Anybody else? I've got a couple of letters <laughs> over here or for me to recognize it. But, Gene, let me tell you, Renee, just what Jesus means to me and my attitude is the same thing as John. My little children, I, I, I don't want you to sin. But if you do sin, 
Some of you sitting back say, what in the world has the preacher done so bad? N nothing. <laughs> we got an advocate with the Father. Can I tell you maybe one or two more things? Everybody writing these down? He's my hope. And without him, it is hopeless. You see, because I'm looking for that blessed hope, I'm looking for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Boy, if you ain't a child of God, and you're in this world, no wonder people do the things they do. No wonder they just seem to be like animals. But Jesus is my hope. And my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I dare not trust. Who? I'm going to rewrite the song. I don't trust any other thing but holding on to Jesus' name. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I'm going to tell you, I don't, I, I'm not going to ask what time it is. It won't make any difference. I love my children. I love my children. If I get the opportunity, y'all know this. And I'm on my deathbed. I will call them in one by one and tell them how much they, I love them and how much they have added to my life. And I might just turn around and bless them. I'm going to tell you something else. I love my wife. I have two, two things that I have dealt with that I would say maybe it's fears. One is that I was standing in front of the congregation. I'm, I'm unprepared. The next thing will be in connection with my wife. I do not know how in the world people wife swap these days. Billy Whitfield, other than God. I consider my wife to be there. Oh, I didn't tell you altogether the story, right? Jim, I just don't want anybody else having my wife. And I'm starting to love grandchildren. How many of you love your grandchildren? You better, you better say something, especially if they're sitting beside you. You know what, y'all, that's good. Now they're going to kiss him. Y'all, that's all good. God, that's the way it's supposed to be. But the great, the first and great commandment above all is you love God. Because when I love God, and I need to do a better job, but when I love God, I love my wife the way I'm supposed to. 
I love my children the way I'm supposed to. I love my grandchildren the way I'm supposed to. I love the brethren because it's hard sometimes the way I'm supposed to. And what's even harder sometimes is loving your enemies and those that will just spitefully use you. But if you put God first, everything else shall comes in place. Won't you stand? How many took the test this morning? How'd you do? How'd you do?